As per archaic physics, the ether is quintessence, a perfect substance that permeated all matter, including the cosmos, and was even responsible for creating the planets and the stars. It was held that it was a substance that allowed electromagnetic waves through without resistance, and also did not impede any other forms of matter or energy, until Einstein's special theory of relativity came along and changed all of that. Or did it? This work seeks to show the astounding implications involved with this special theory and how it is no accident that the one scientist that everyone is familiar with is Albert Einstein and the one equation that everyone is familiar with is E equals mc squared. The experiment sought to prove if ether actually existed, and this was attempted by using what is called an interferometer, which is an arrangement of mirrors designed so that a beam of light could be divided and sent in two directions at the same time. What they were looking for was a change in the velocity between the two light beams due to the interference of the ether stream. The result of their experiment was that the velocity remained unchanged regardless of the direction that the beams of light were sent. In other words, the result was negative. With this result, observing scientists told themselves that they had two choices. Get rid of the ether entirely and all previous theories based upon it that dealt with electromagnetism, electricity and light. Or keep the ether and abandon the theory that the earth is in motion. Essentially, if the ether existed to them, the experiment told them that the velocity of the earth through the ether was exactly zero. Can one see the problem here? What would this do to public perception in regards to their home called earth? If the Earth was moving exactly zero, meaning not at all, where exactly was it sitting? What exactly was our place in the universe? In 1905, at the age of 26, Albert Einstein published a paper that would, in essence, be the footprint for his special theory of relativity, which asserted that the laws of nature are the same for all uniformly moving systems. This again for the scientific community, and thus the public, brought the earth from its stationary position as related to the sun, and without the use of ether, so to speak, set the world of physics on fire.
What did this mean for all of us? A great deal if one is able to squelch through all of the tedious semantics and get to the true meaning of what this theory is actually stating. By accepting relativity as it stands, along with time dilation and all of its other relativistic properties, the world is accepting that there is no such thing as simultaneity, or what could be called the now. That's right, there is no such thing as now, which means that this science also gets rid of paradox and moves itself entirely into the realm of contradiction. To say that there is no now that is independent of a system of reference means that all conceptualization of a divine source goes straight into the trash bin. The aspect of now is something that the spiritual side of man has indicated for as long as we have been able to express it. With relativity this is gone, because everything is not unified by any kind of quality. It is all separated by various quantities of time. There is no now, only event markers of quantity. Hence the quality of the spirit by default is erased from the equation. Quality is in the trash and quantity is king absolute. The other aspect that is important to be aware of which hinges the idea of relativity together is the relativistic belief that there are related and unrelated systems. Down the drain goes the idea that everything is connected to everything else. If there are unrelated systems, this means that there are unrelated causalities and thus unrelated effects. This encourages the idea of division and since there can be systems or galaxies that are unrelated, what hope is there of tiny and seemingly insignificant man being related to God? There is none. With the special theory of relativity taking front stage, there is no God, and there is no altruistic connection to anything. It is all relative. It is all self-centered. It is all nihilism. The hands of the clock swing the pendulum of dualistic nonsensical relativity which directs the show. There is no interconnectedness, only disconnectedness. How is this so? Let's think through this. For most people in this world their system or point of reference would be God, or what could be called a source or a creator of some kind. To have this point of origin means that all other systems flow from it and are therefore connected to this central originator. With relativity, there is no such thing as a center point. Everything exists as a divided entity, each piece of matter only having reference to the matter that is a part of its own system, which would undoubtedly mean that proximity itself is the conduit through which all things derive their meaning and perspective. By saying that all systems are separate, is to directly say that God is not a part of all systems, which would give one the basis for interrelation, but since creation itself is separated by the concept of time, then even God, if God were here, would also not have a clue if the stars in Alpha Centauri, for example, were still there for another 4.3 years. Here's where the contradictions come into play. If we were to see the stars in Alpha Centauri disappear or go supernova, this we are told would be something that occurred 4.3 years ago, due to the constant speed of light in all directions. In other words, it was already a memory for that system, for that duration of time, before the information even arrived to us. This is how science would have us think of our own memories. How long does it take to recall a memory from 4 years ago? How about 10, 20, or even 50 years ago for some people that are old enough? Did it take 4 years to recall? 
Did it take 10, 20, or 50 years to bring back the memory of an event that you had? Probably not. It most likely happened now, which is something that relativity does not allow as per the principles of relativity of simultaneity. To recall in the timeless now should be impossible because you have moved away from your inertial reference point of that memory event years ago. So how does instant recall happen? To remember is to bring back something that is external or which belongs to a certain set or class. This is why thoughts can be measured because like the lower density which we call the physical, the psychical still has a measurable vibration which can be obtained albeit on a higher frequency scale. For relativity to be the truth, it must follow its own commands. That the laws of the universe are uniform, and this means that if we are 4.3 light years away from the occurrence of an event, and need that same amount of time before receiving that event's light information, this also means that the electrical light connections in the brain would also need 4 point light years, or at least Earth years, to receive the information from an event that happened 4.3 years ago. Uniformity is uniformity, regardless of the system, whether it be the universe or the system of the human biology that is a part of the universe, including the electrically light-connected matter of the brain. Relativity is a principle of observation, which requires an observer, and memories are pure observation. To say that these theories do not apply to the observational tactics of the mind, which is based on calculations of light within the mind, is to say that observation itself does not apply. If the psychical can be discarded as being a complete and total illusion, then so can the physical. This same trouble extends itself to a very common and very sense-oriented question in regards to the supposed beginning of the universe, which science likes to term the Big Bang. The question that is posed is, where is the center point or origin of the Big Bang? Well, according to relativity, there was no center point. The Big Bang happened everywhere, all at the same time. So where is everything expanding into if this Big Bang happened everywhere all at once? Would it not be just as plausible to say that everything is contracting then instead of expanding, via us getting constantly smaller due to energy loss perhaps? Wouldn't also the last galaxies then truly be up against a wall? Where did all of the matter come from before the Big Bang occurred? This would automatically imply that existence, well, already existed before that point. But we can't use the word point, because that implies a singular reference again, which is not possible with relativity. So before what we now call the universe, there would have been what? The non-averse? The explanation of science was that everything was big, but then after the Big Bang, everything just got bigger. So what exactly is the bigger expanding into? This automatically implies that there is an outside aspect, otherwise expansion is not possible, which would mean that the universe is on the inside. The inside of what? What is on the outside? What is the shape of the container? If, as science says, no new energy can be created that is not already a part of the universe, is everything just being diluted and thinned out from a previously thickened state? What would be diluting everything, since that would mean that something new would have to be added to change the previous formations and more thickened state of everything? The same holds true for what is called the inflation principle of matter. Perhaps there is just a redistribution happening, where some parts of the universe are becoming thicker, while other parts, by displacement, must become more diluted and stretched out. Is the universe a closed system as we are being told? Closed off from what then? 
This is obviously the reason that physics now adopts the equation of E equals mc squared, whereby mass and energy are simply transmutable aspects of each other. But this is again also to say that if energy is simply mass at the constant speed of light squared, then we and all other life forms by definition must be light, because we are energy, and to deny as much is to deny the very facet of life itself. If E equals mc squared, it applies to all matter in the universe, including the matter of the human or animal form, or else one finds themselves with another religion, defending a patently absurd supposition that only scientists get to pick and choose which types of energy they are referring to, and if this is the case, then these theories are truly worthless and offer no help to the populace in regards to the awareness of our place in the scheme of all things. Everything, as is told from these perspectives, was just a random act of chaos, without specific design or intent. Why was Einstein even talking about God? With relativity, God is taken out of the equation, because there are no relations between systems, and if there is God, it would most certainly be ascertained that God would be related to all systems and all things. In the universe of relativity, all there can be is dice playing, and a lot of it. His quote should instead read something like this, There is no God in the universe, only dice playing. This would at least be true to the theory. Here is where the contradictions get more perplexing. According to quantum mechanics, a particle in one place can affect a particle in another area at the exact same moment, even if these particles are light years apart from each other. Yet, according to the special theory of relativity, there is no such thing as absolute simultaneity. The two particles could not affect each other, since they would be separated by vast distances. So which is it? The possibility of simultaneity, or the impossibility of it? Not only that, to say that there is no such thing as simultaneity makes the whole idea of the Big Bang look absolutely preposterous. If the Big Bang happened at the same time everywhere, is this not the very definition of simultaneity?
Other pertinent questions in regards to the Big Bang have to do with how the whole process got underway. If it was a matter of heat and redistribution, where did this energy come from and what forces were already at work in all places to make such an event possible? If there is no origin point, this means that the entire system that we now call the universe would have had to have been brought up to the crux of this great event just before the Big Bang entirely uniformly. How is this possible? This is not just equivalency we are talking about. It is ultimate synchronization. One might be inclined to call this event the God Act of Simultaneity. Of course, science is just trying to claw its way out of a paper bag with this one, which is why it wants you to remain in a contradictory mindset about us being told that all galaxies are in constant movement away from us. If every single galaxy was in movement away from us, would this not make ourselves the center of the universe? Is this not just a whole bunch of talk from the church again? How do we also reconcile the contradiction between time events that are unidirectional along with forward and backward motion? Perhaps it is too telling to think then effect. Paradox proves to all who have ever seen it that cause and effect are unitary and simultaneous. To reconcile this, one would need to get rid of the concept of backwards. One event follows another and no one and nothing anywhere ever is doing anything at the same moment in the now. There is only forwards and nothing else, just like the actions of a pawn on a chessboard. If, just as an example, Alpha Centauri ceases to exist and we only find out about it in 4.3 years, this is to state that Alpha Centauri is always in our future, or is it past? But since everything is said to be only relative, this would also mean that we are the constant future, or past, for the potential inhabitants of Alpha Centauri. Are we moving towards the time events of Alpha Centauri, or are the events moving towards us? Is the future moving into us, or are we moving into it? Are we the past or the future for Alpha Centauri, and would this not indicate that to know about the past, we need to move into what is called the future? If this is the truth, then it is the truth for all systems, regardless of size, including the system of humanity. Therefore, to know about our own past, we must continue moving into the future. Is at least this aspect not true just from an observational standpoint? Would this not eventually circle back into itself? Truly time would have to be a circular phenomenon. Additionally, if Alpha Centauri ceases to exist, its light will be said to travel to the ends of the cosmos, making it still existent so long as it has space to travel through. And since there is no center point, there cannot be an outer edge or periphery, for that requires a reference to a center, which does not exist, relatively speaking. Everything is its own center. So there is either no God, or everyone and everything is God. Since time would be a circle, as is obviously the case just by observing the way we keep track of time, this means that the universe is also circular, and the formative event of our beginning will be coming back around to meet us once again. Even logically, this would imply that the cause of our beginning will become the effect of our end, birth and death. Relativity states that the faster an object moves, the slower that time becomes for it as relative to objects that are not moving as fast. But in which direction? If objects themselves are the relative basis for our perception, then that means that they are affected both ways by time based on direction. 
because for an object to have multiple directions in its event status would mean that time itself would have to have at least two directions for its own event correlation. Cause and effect, which according to relativity are never simultaneous occurrences due to time's linearity or one-dimensional aspect. This would mean that when an object is moving towards the observer, then time is moving forward, but when moving away, time would be flowing backwards, or at the very least slowing down. The only way to get around this conundrum is to say that time is dimensionless. It exists only as a linear plane moving in one direction, albeit at various tempos. Of course, this is what is called the space-time continuum, whereby there are three dimensions of space and only one dimension of time. This makes time flat, and is the closest to the esoteric truth of our current reality that science has gotten. Time for us has been made one-dimensional in this universe, because we have been pawned. The object of interest that is moving towards us, the observer, and making our individual time move forward is death. We can only know about the past by moving into the future. This is the time dilation that relativity talks about, but is incorrect in its assumption, because according to relativity, our death has already occurred. We just haven't been informed of it yet. Time dilation is what allows a variable in chronological degrees through a change of aperture. What was closed has been opened more, or vice versa. This is also how light works, because the summation of all this comes down to light, which is externally created through duality, yet internally consummated through unity. For our reality, this is how we will understand the occult origins of where we are. The aperture of our minds is open enough to allow us to attain insight, or it is not. If we look at the word religion, it could be shown that a rearrangement of the letters in anagram form gives us origin L. The term L is from the Hebrew L, meaning God. The word origin means the place where something begins. Hence, religion truly means the search for the origin of God, or the source, the origin of L. Science, coincidentally, is also seeking out the explanation of beginnings and origins, along with creating various formula to manifest products through diverse combinations. Its difference is that it is a search for the answers of creation without there being a creator. That is its primary supposition. There is creation, but no creator behind it. Everything has occurred and exists through sheer blind force, and any type of order that exists happen all circumstantially through accident and sheer luck. To admit differently at all is to admit to the existence of some type of creative being that has a conscious mind such as ours. And with the current methodology of science, this is a most abhorrent thought. A divided science and a divided religion is a fact of our reality, which constitutes itself as our divided mind. The science of the left brain and the religion of the right hemisphere. So long as these two constituents remain separate, there can never be reconciliation, and the true answers to our origins and our place in the scheme of all things will continue to remain concealed. A science divided from religion denies God, and a religion divided from science denies the true works of God. Both sides end up being destructive forces in their pursuit of a divided truth, which is no truth at all, because truth is whole. A truth in fractions cannot be called as such because the whole cannot be divided from itself and still remain whole. This is why to be whole is to be holy, 
and it is through this fact alone that there cannot be any outside saviors. It is impossible. Because if one is to think of God as the truth, and you are a part of God's creation, this would mean that you are already at one with God in the holy communion of all things. And to say that one needs saving from this is to also say that God needs saving. It is only a sick, diseased, and destructive mind that wants to see others burn in eternal retribution for simply not holding on to a mental belief. A belief that insists that you make a choice of division, which is a mere political tactic, and is simply more battery talk. Positive, negative, the material or the immaterial, good or evil, heaven or hell, science or religion. Science is no better in this regard. Instead of an eternal hell, it damns people to an eternal oblivion after this life. One came into this world through random clashes of matter that electrically form the composite aspects which eventually enable the glob between our ears called a brain to make connections which through the lottery win of all winds gave each of us this aspect we call life with an idea of the individual self. After this individual self dies at whatever random age that event happens, there is no spirit force that goes anywhere. You simply cease to be for all eternity, and there will never be you to experience anything ever again. Nihilism at its utmost extreme. Science has its version of hell, and religion has its version. Both have taken their perspectives to the utmost extreme of stupidity. It is like the junior high dance, where all the girls are on one side of the gym and all the boys are on the other. Both sides are too immature to meet halfway while the music is playing. The music is life, and we are missing the dance, which is why humanity truly needs guidance. Guidance is guide dance, and every time there have been those who did their best to walk the path of truth, humans have killed them off. Mass genocide has been the response because ignorance of the truth keeps everyone in the comfort of the darkness. This is the reason that we remain cloaked in the ether of the matrix, which is the composite substance of this place, and this is written all over the language of the angels. And to also take note that there's no Earth Day. That's going to be very significant as we keep going along. There is no Earth Day because there is no Earth. At least not how everyone thinks they know it to be. There is only ether, which is what our plasma reacts against, which is why plasma is derived from the Greek plasma, meaning anything formed. The ether is what gives birth to all matter, and until science accepts this fact, it will continue to grope in the dark as much as religion. We are consumed by ether on the earth, with the letters of earth being rearranged into ether. Of course, the anagram for earth is also heart which is how our plasma is ionically produced with each heartbeat as we breathe in the ether because we are all breathers, breathers. 
we breathe in the ether with each breath, and this pulls us through this singular dimension of time as pawns. Our breath is affected by the variations in temperature, which is a cause and effect of the weather, weather, seeing that all weather patterns are affected by the ether. Whether or not one believes this is beside the point. The truth needs no agreement. We all arrived here due to the renting or division of cells in our parents, parents, which are called the father and mother, aether, other, ether. The child in the womb must survive by feeding from the nutrients of its mother, which is all manifestly derived from the ether of the earth, which is the mother to us all. Mother earth is mother ether. It is the reason that the word weather, when divided again without the letter W, becomes eat her. To eat her is to consume the ether of the matrix womb, which provides the context that is necessary to understand the esoteric symbol of the pelican, whereby the mother pelican wounds her own breast to feed her young with the blood that flows from this wound. This symbol is related to the crucifixion of the Christ symbol, with even Dante speaking of Christ our pelican. The cross is the symbol of the crossing over between the planes of life and death, and from death to life. As it stands, we are truly creating our own prison, seeing that for plasma to exist, ionization is necessary, which is produced from the duality of positive and negative forces. This plasma reacts against the ether stream and creates all forms of matter, which is where the symbol of the triangle of manifestation comes into play. A triangle is the trinity of positive, negative, and outcome, seeing that to make a connection, there needs to be three divergent lines, or a pair of opposites that join and make new matter. This is why the word three is rearranged to spell ether. We are currently giving to Caesar instead of giving to God, because everything that is outside of the neutral path of freedom is for the system of imprisoning the heart. This we all do together, tog ether, which is to be clothed in ether. Even in the English language, the verb tog means to provide with clothes or put clothes on. We are all clothed in the matrix womb, tog ether.
By gaining carnal knowledge, man was sentenced to the imprisonment of the serpent, with pent meaning prison, closely confined. The trap was the ether, which is the fruit of knowledge of both good and evil. In other words, the trinity of creation that requires opposites to attract and manifest in various forms. This forms the pentagram, which is the symbol for the five elements combined that produce the seething energies of Lucifer, who is the bearer of light. The element that bears our creative light in its matrix womb is the dark ether. The ether has truly closed, closed us off from God. The heart is imprisoned by the deoxyribonucleic cage, or rib cage. How few have read the passages from Genesis closely. In Genesis 3.14 and 3.15, the Lord is speaking to the serpent, saying that upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. This passage is clearly stating that the Shining One is no longer a multidimensional being. He has been demoted to the lowest strata of existence, the universe. A single dimension of time or space-time at the bottom of the barrel that circles back endlessly onto itself. Most also do not catch the fact that in Genesis 3.15, the Lord is still talking to the serpent when he says that he will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. This is important because it indirectly states that Lucifer gave his seed to woman, which obviously changed us as a species from that point on. Truly a severe and reprimandable offense in the eyes of creation. It is not until Genesis 3.17 that he addresses Adam for his transgression. The penalty for his violation is condemnation into the ether, which is stated in Genesis 3.19. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. Our object of interest that we all must face in our lives is death, which is the other side of the ether. Hence, death, death. The beginning of our existence will once again become our end. To know about our past, we must continue moving into the future. To know about life, we must move into death. From dust back to dust.
you think that's air you're breathing now? While we are here, it is within our capacity to create within the ether stream. We create that which is in our hearts, just as it has been said. We reap, harvest what we sow, seed. If it is not obvious why the system works so hard to control the direction of everyone's energy flow, this should make it quite obvious now. The ether became our cursed ground, which in sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. We eat, eat from the ether with our teeth, created from our duality prison, which is based on our choices being ether, ether, this or that. It is ether or, or perhaps neither, neither. Scripture is really a script tour of everything that is buried underneath us. We go nowhere because we are truly now here, and there is really here, seeing that the word here is in there while the anagram of the word there is ether. The real illusion is distance. The real illusion is time. The matrix construct has been authored, ethered by an inextricable power that seeks continuance through transmutation. The constant transmutation of energy and mass. This is Pan's labyrinth, which is the constant permutation of time. And just like a clock, only one source of escapement is possible through the all-knowing heart. The mind alone does not have the capacity for freedom. Everything with it will always become an argumentation due to its corrosively divided nature. The middle path has forever been the only way out. One must, even as Gurdjieff used to say, bury the dog. It is not an accident that God spelled backwards is dog, because we are caught in the extension cord of time, which is a story line that is reversed over and over again just like a dog that circles itself, chasing after its own tail. This has become the perversion of the heart, with all the sadistic desires that have crowned its path, which eternally and consistently only ever leads to failure. If one wants to only take the scientific path, they are no better off, for its premise asserts to us that we are just randomly distributed and coagulated meat sacks with no divine purpose and no connection to spirit. Science wants everyone to believe this so badly so that we all hate ourselves and merge with machines for the promise of eternal salvation. It doesn't get more pseudo-religious than that. It doesn't get more priestly. The false religions of the world have their priests and minions running around doing the same thing, convincing everyone to hate themselves, doing their utmost to convince us all that we are worthless and in need of external salvation which never arrives. E equals MC squared because Saturn is the MC or master of this mare age ceremony that is based upon Mary time law. The timeless now which is the freedom of the heart has been replaced with the science of a time filled relativity. A science divided from religion and a religion divided from science is like playing an out of tune instrument. It matters not in whose hands the instrument is in, the results will always be disastrous. The matrix womb is ether, and we are all swimming in it while it carries our light. It has been said that the truth will set you free, and this means to make oneself whole again, which means to carry our own light, 
To carry our own light is to shine our way to the inner gates of the truth and out of the nether world. <laughs>